<laughs> Good evening. Uh, welcome to the Space Center Houston's Thought Leader Series. My name is William Harris. I'm president and CEO here at Space Center Houston, and I'm delighted to have you here for this extraordinary program. As a friendly reminder, could you please silence your mobile devices if you have a mobile phone? Space is the great frontier, and its exploration is fraught with challenges and dangers. At Space Center Houston, we believe that space exploration benefits humanity, STEM learning really drives our natural curiosity and enables achievement. Advancing critical thinking and problem solving skills also enables and fuels innovation. From the slides on the screen behind me, you'll see some of the ways we're living those beliefs through our education and public programming. A great way to keep abreast of the many activities and programs is to become a member here at Space Center Houston. So please talk to one of our career staff if, uh, to get more information about how you can become a member and get on our list for these kind of wonderful programs for the, for the public. We are a 501c3 nonprofit educational foundation, so your membership supports our charitable mission. We're also the official visitor center for NASA Johnson Space Center. We're also a Smithsonian affiliate, and I'm really proud to share that we recently received certification as an authorized autism service center. We're actually the first science center in the world to, receive, uh, to achieve this kind of uh, distinction. And it's really aligned with our core values of embracing diversity, inclusion, equity, and accessibility, because we want to be a destination for everyone. As most of you are aware, 2019 will mark the 50th anniversary of a milestone for humanity when Apollo 11 astronauts Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were the first humans to step on the moon. Space Center Houston will kick off more than a year of celebratory events this October 23rd with our fall luncheon to the moon and beyond that's going to be held in downtown Los Angeles at the Marriott Marquis Hotel. We're going to be recognizing the extraordinary achievements of legendary Apollo era flight director Gene Kranz and his tireless advocacy to restore the Apollo Mission Control Room at Johnson Space Center. All proceeds from the luncheon are going to help close out Space Center Houston's uh, $5 million campaign for funding to restore the Apollo Mission Control at Johnson Space Center, which is designated as a National Historic Landmark. And our goal is to have that completed in time for the 50th anniversary in July of 2019. You can learn more information about that event um, outside the theater. We have some information on the table, or you can look at our website. So as I stated earlier, space exploration is dangerous, yet provides innumerable opportunities for humanity. On any mission, something can go wrong, even with the best laid plans and protocols. Tonight, through this world premiere of the documentary EVA 23, we're privileged to have an insider's view of what happened, why, and most importantly, how teamwork and space exploration is essential for success. We do know that this crisis had a happy ending, as we're joined this evening by astronauts Luca Permitano and Chris Cassidy, who are on this EVA. <laughs> and we're also really honored to be joined by Chris Hansen, who led the investigation on behalf of NASA. So Chris, we're thrilled to have you here as well. Following the film, we'll have a moderated discussion and audience questions with Luca, Chris, and Chris. So at any time, and we're going to broadcast this on the, on the screen as well, you can send by email your questions to thoughtleaders at spacecenter.org. So as you're watching the film, if you have a question, please email it, and we're going to be compiling those. Uh, we'll be asking some questions of, of the three of them, and then your questions will be uh, put to them as well. This documentary is the brainchild of Mark Havikin, president and CEO of Space City Films. Mark is a passionate supporter of space exploration, and among his many accolades, uh, he was awarded a Lone Star Emmy. And so we're so thrilled to collaborate with Space City Films in premiering this uh, incredible film for all of you this evening. So I'd like to actually ask Mark to come up and introduce the film before we have the screening. Please join me in welcoming Mark Havikin. William, thank you so much for the kind words. If you folks, if there's anybody in this audience that hasn't been to Space Center Houston in a while, I really, really encourage you to come back down here and check this place out, especially if you have kids. It's, it's a remarkable thing. Under William's leadership, Space Center Houston is undergoing a remarkable transformation. And those of us at Space, Center, uh, Space City Films are very proud to be affiliated with a world-class science and education center. 
So good evening. This is uh, really a thrill for all of us. I, I'm, I'm thrilled to see such a packed crowd. This is really, this is really crazy. I'm, I've never done this before. Uh, so please bear with me if I stumble around a little bit. And I'm old, so I have to have notes and read a little bit. On January 29, 2015, Chris Hansen made a presentation to a group of executives right here at Space Center Houston in Experience to Lead's Apollo Learning Experience. Uh, they, they teach astronauts uh, leadership lessons in using the Apollo uh, program as, as a way to do that. So Alex Dieth and Austin Havikin from our shop were here that night running camera and documenting the event. And so the very next morning, on Friday morning, they appeared at my doorway just, just vibrating. They were so excited. And they told me that we absolutely had to make a documentary about EVA 23. So they sketched the main points of the story. They told me about Chris Hansen and about his passion and his storytelling ability and, uh, and, and really how this harrowing and, and dramatic spacewalk came to be. So uh, over the next few months, Austin and Phil Sexton, who also works with us, uh, put together a treatment for the show. And they decided together they were going to co-direct this program. So Austin and Phil directed the show that you're about to see, and I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, once the treatment was complete, we shopped the concept around a little bit because making films is not an inexpensive proposition and we were trying to raise some funding so that we could go do this. Uh, and and we, we didn't really do a very good job. So one day Alex came to us and he had met with Dick Richardson, who's down here on the second row with Experience to Lead. And through uh, Dick and International Paper, they provided the funding for us to get this thing off the ground. And, and Dick, I really want to thank you and Alex, who's with Experience to Lead now, to really help us get this initial funding and get it going. So we knew there was no way we we're going to make the film that we really wanted to make without participation from NASA. Uh, there's just no way. And several people were crucial to making that happen. I want to I acknowledge them here. So we'd really like to thank Mike Kincaid, Debbie Condor, James Hartsfield, Megan Sumner, and Mitch Utes over at the uh, ISS office. And he was able to provide us with some imagery that when you see this, you're going to feel like you're on EVA with Chris and Luca, I promise you, especially on this monster thing here. <laughs> if it weren't for Chris Hansen, we wouldn't be here tonight. Absolutely not. We wouldn't have a story to tell. You'll meet Chris after the film, so I'm not going to do his introduction. But I want to tell you that everybody at Space City Films loves this guy. <laughs> we adore Chris. He's a tremendous storyteller, and, and he... he he bent over backwards to help us get this thing made. It was, it, there's no way we could have done it without him. We've worked with a lot of astronauts over the last 30 years. I'm dating myself. From the guys from Mercury and a lot of the Apollo guys, and especially during the shuttle program and ISS, and now the, the folks that are going to fly commercial crew not very far. Most of them are as you would expect, most astronauts. They're dedicated. They're hardworking. They're extremely focused. And to the public, a lot of times they're just larger than life, and, and, and duly so. But in reality, most astronauts are very friendly and outgoing and very approachable. And I have to tell you this, I don't want to embarrass you guys, but Luca and Chris, who you're going to meet a little later, are some of the coolest dudes to ever wear the wings. <laughs> yes, they are a couple of badasses. They are, but they are also super nice guys, and there's no way we could have made this film without them. And these guys are, you're going to find out here in a minute, trust me on this. And, and by the way, I'm a little off script, but I hope that somebody brings up, that Chris Hansen told us a story the other day of, of Chris Cassidy and the Hawaii Iron Man, and I hope that comes up. It's amazing. And Luca too, yeah, but it's an amazing story. I'm not going to rob it. Anyway, I can tell you one thing that holds true for all astronauts, and no kidding. The, one of the biggest, hardest things for astronauts is the demand on their time. Whether it's nonstop training or incessant meetings or PR tours or travel to meet the hundreds of thousands of men and women who make it possible for us to fly in space, finding a hole in an astronaut's schedule to make a little movie like this is quite a challenge. Not only did Luca and Chris make time to shoot this film, but they also worked their schedule so they could be here tonight with us in person. Both of them, with Chris Hansen, in the room with us. It's just, it's an amazing, amazing thing. And you guys, I, I, I mean this in all sincerity. Thank you so much. We couldn't have done this without you. This is a, a remarkable thing. 
I also want to give special thank you to William Harris and Tracy Lamb here at Space Center Houston uh, because they were the ones that made this evening possible. I promise I'm going to sit down in just a second. <laughs> we took EVA 23, uh, the trailer, and a bunch of movie posters to Space Symposium with us this year. And uh, I guess it was on Thursday, Tracy came by the booth, or Wednesday I guess it was, came by the booth and he says, what's, what's this? And so we explained the film and we showed the trailer and Tracy immediately said, how'd you like to premiere that at Space Center Houston? On the big screen in the Space Center Theater. Well, duh. <laughs> so here we are. It's an amazing thing. And finally, filmmaking is a team sport and is my privilege and my good fortune to have an incredible staff of extraordinarily talented filmmakers and storytellers. Austin Havikin is our director of photography, but he's also a producer director, a screenwriter, and editor. Austin was the screenwriter, cinematographer, and co-director of the film that you're about to see. He's also my son, and I am one proud papa. Phil Sexton is one of the most talented and creative men that I know. And I'll be completely transparent with you. He's like a second son to me. Phil is our creative director and post-production supervisor, but he's also a cinematographer and director extraordinaire. He has an unquenchable thirst for filmmaking and storytelling, and you're going to see some of his mastery here in a moment, I promise. Phil co-directed, edited, and created the cool graphics for this film. And oh, by the way, he also ran Steadicam on it. Our newest storyteller is Maya Petrova Davidson, an incredibly talented editor. She's a young woman that who she's a treasured member of our staff, but unfortunately, she couldn't be with us tonight because she's traveling with her family, and, and we miss having Maya here. All of the folks that I just described are filmmakers, but I also wanted to acknowledge the other members of our creative team who worked on this project. Mike Hughes, Danny Rees, Alex Diaz, and Ryan Nguyen. All I did for this program was provide the resources to make it made and get out of the way. And so now, thankfully, I'm going to sit down and get out of your way. <laughs> I hope you enjoy your trip to space. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great privilege to introduce the world premiere of EVA 23. Well, heartfelt congratulations to Mark and the Space City Films team. That was an incredible film. I'm going to do a reintroduction. We have a practice now of broadcasting through Facebook Live, our programs. So uh, we're now going to be joined by people online who are going to be watching the panel. And so welcome to all of you who are now online joining us on Facebook. Um, and if you have questions, again, for the panel, please send them to um, thoughtleaders at spacecenter.org. And we will uh, put those, some of those questions to the panel during the course of our discussion. I'm now very pleased to introduce our panel. I'd like to ask them, please, to come up to the seats in the front of the room. So Luca, Chris, and Chris, if you could please come up here and have a seat. And I'm going to introduce each of you. Great. We. We have here in the middle, you guys can have a seat and I'll, I'll introduce you. Um, delighted to have Luca Parmitano, who is a European Space Agency astronaut. Between May and November of 2013, he spent six months on board the International Space Station as a member of Expedition 3637. Um, he's conducted two spacewalks while on the International Space Station and he is a major with the Italian Air Force. We're joined next to him by Chris Cassidy. Uh, Chris is a U.S. astronaut with NASA, and he's been a veteran of two space flights, uh, STS-127 and Expedition 35. During STS-127, Chris served as a mission specialist, and he was the 500th person in space, which is pretty exciting, a nice round number. <laughs> <laughs> At ISS Expedition, uh, Chris served as flight engineer. Uh, he's a U.S. Navy SEAL and has been deployed twice to the Mediterranean and twice to Afghanistan. Uh, he actually traveled here from his cosmos uh, yesterday, so we're, we're going to prod him and make sure he has water and caffeine to make it through the panel. He's probably a little bit jet-lagged, but we're really thrilled that you came here from Russia uh, to join us this evening. 
And last but not least, Chris Hansen, who's a manager of extravehicular activity office here at NASA Johnson Space Center. Um, he's been the chief of the crew and thermal systems division and also chief engineer uh, for the International Space Station. And after the EVA 23 incident, uh, Chris became the chair of the Spacewalk Mishap Investigation Board to review what had occurred and why. So I'm really excited that we're joined by this um, group of, of gentlemen after seeing the film. I'm going to move over here to the chair and we're going to begin our discussion about uh, EVA 23. So I'm really excited to know that for, I know for, for Luca and Chris, they had not seen the documentary. This is their first time seeing the film. So I'm kind of curious if you could just share your impressions having seen the, the documentary for the first time. Well, I'll start. It's yeah. a little weird seeing your head take up the whole entire, <laughs> the whole entire thing, but um, hats off to the team. It was a really fantastic film and it, it brings chills to me just watching that and thinking about the event and, and kind of running it through, through my brain uh, as it was playing up there. I could talk more about that but as we go on but uh, really 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 cool to see this film come together thank you very much sure so luca i'm very curious i know this did you relive the moment i mean it was pretty <laughs> t uh, suspenseful the whole situation yeah. well you know i'm my own ultimate spoiler so <laughs> <laughs> right. i i kind of knew the the end of it. <laughs> And we're thankful for that. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> I thought the movie was, it's, I think it's really well done. It really catches uh, what, um, what we thought at those moments. Um, and what I really like um, already, if I can uh, already put a little bit of advance on what I'm gonna, we're going to be talking later, is that it doesn't really focus on one individual. And it really focuses on, on the team. And uh, that's absolutely of the utmost importance to understand. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so can I say something to add to that? Um, Lucas said something really important. Sitting around you guys in this room today are some of the hundreds of people that make spacewalks possible. The flight controllers, the engineers, the EVA team, they're here with you. And what I really want to do is thank those guys because they make this possible. And we didn't want to focus on the fact that we made mistakes. We really want to focus on the fact that we learn from those mistakes and we get better. And I really appreciate them being here with us today to, to look at this and hope they really understand this is really in honor of you guys who make this possible. So. So I'm curious, seeing the film now, are there things that you noticed that for the first time in watching the documentary, because you were actually seeing footage of the crisis as it was rolling out, are there things that you were noticing for the first time, things you might have done differently having viewed the documentary and the footage? Um, it's a question for all three of you. Um, I'll start on that one because um, I absolutely would do some, something differently. and and. Uh, it, I talked about it in the movie where I have this image in my mind when, when Luca turns the corner around, around uh, for those that are familiar with the space station layout behind, around this place called Z1 on the backside of the space station. And I thought, F word. <laughs> I, need, I need to be with him right now. I need to be with my buddy that's the whole reason we go out in pairs that's why my my background on the seal teams we had dive buddies and in, in buds and in, in seal training you never were greater than six feet farther than six feet from your dive buddy and we have a similar concept in spacewalks we're there for each other and i just felt like i was letting luca down by not being with him the way we had our safety tethers routed I, and this all played through my head in a very fast, short amount of time. I thought, okay, well, that would be a big deal to the space station because I kind of know we're not coming out for another spacewalk tomorrow or next week. It's going to be a little while. And to have a safety tether kind of run all through the, um, the front part of the space station where the mobile transporter moves with the robotic arm, thought that would be kind of bad. For a fleeting second, I thought of just unhooking to Luca and unhooking my safety tether and chucking it and it would reel itself back in, but 
you can get famous for lots of stuff at NASA. And <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to be famous being for that, for that as it bonked its way through some, some, some things. So, um, so I decided not to do that and expeditiously go back to the airlock and I, and I and thought again, okay, if he's not there yet when I get there, um, I just will trace his safety tether around the other direction and, and, and find him. Uh, all of that played through my head in a very, very short amount of time as I saw him disappear. And uh, that's what I would do differently. I would vocalize out loud to the whole um, space to ground loop uh, communication channel and, and say, hold on, stop. We need to be together. Let's sort this out. If we need to just kind of go back a little bit together to put my tether in a place where we know it's not going to interfere with motion, uh, moving equipment or something like this, but um, I really would have stopped to keep together. So, Luca, did you see anything that you would do differently now watching the, the footage of what transpired? Well, where do I start? <laughs> I <know. laughs> well, the first thing is probably that I would uh, be more vocal about what I really felt about the water. Uh, but, you know, you, you can be famous for a lot of things, and most, most of them are the wrong reasons to be famous, including drowning on the space station. But uh, one thing I didn't want to do is, uh, we mentioned all the people that are in here that work in the EVA environment. And you don't want to disappoint them. There's so much work on the ground going on just for you to be out those six hours. You don't want to disappoint them. You don't want to be the, you will pardon my French, a wimp. <laughs> 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 you don't want to be the you don't want to be the wimp that says, "Oh, I I, I have a problem in my helmet. I I need to go back inside." I any you know so I, I I'm not thinking. I don't think that I tried to minimize the problem. I honestly didn't think it was a problem while it was happening. But then it I was I was worried about the water getting in my ears and cutting the communication off because that is an uncomfortable situation. My background in flying. As a fighter pilot, as a test pilot, communication is so uh, so important, so basic for any operations that I really didn't want that to happen. And I did think it was a nuisance. But then going back to what Chris was saying, um, I also wish that I voiced that concern that I wish that Chris had come with me. But you have to know Chris. So to be in orbit with Chris, is to feel that somebody always has your back. You feel so confident that nothing can possibly go wrong. It's not just, and I'm sorry that you're here, you have to hear this. Kind of <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're just going to have to take it. <laughs> so, I'll get you back. <laughs> so Chris is mostly unflappable, and you just have, it's just as this aura of confidence around him, and you just feel just that confidence. And so when you're going out on, on a space walk, it is exactly the guy you want. So in no time, I felt that I was in danger of, uh, of something catastrophic happening because I'm like, well, I got Chris. <laughs> I mean, what can happen? I got Chris. And so I didn't voice it because when they told me to go back and, and they didn't say to take that Chris was going to come with me, I thought, well, <coughs> Chris is not coming with me. I guess he doesn't need to. And but that that feeling that Chris had, it was completely speculative in my head that I just wished he'd come with me. And you know, we, we did have the time. We could have had the time to just stop somehow and take a take a couple of minutes to or, to reorganize our tethers. Which it it was it was something that we had talked about it. We talked about the fact that our tethers were going to be wrapped around the space station in different directions, but it was just the, the choreography of the EVA. None of that was improvised. We had talked about it. We knew the risk. We just, the thing is that you don't think about the, uh, the emergencies that actually are going to happen. And if I, if I can take another 30 mm -hmm. seconds, I learned something I learned and then he came back tonight while watching this, is the difference between a contingency and an emergency. To me now, 
than I, that I have the experience. A contingency is something you can plan for. And we had planned for all, for a lot of contingencies, not just us, but also the ground team. We have practiced those. The emergency is when something happens that you just have not thought of. And that's what happened. So, uh, and to, to make the story a little short and finish here, the other thing that came to my head while watching that was like, wow, I really didn't want to be the Italian astronaut that drowned in space. <laughs> right. <laughs> can, can I add a little bit mm -hmm. to that? And I think what kind of lulled us into complete, not complacency, but just acceptance of the situation was as we were statically kind of about this far looking yeah. and without moving, the water was not moving. And I didn't put it, I didn't take another step and think, okay, when Luca begins moving, what then is going to happen to the water? And because uh, as we're talking to each other, the, it just kind of stayed up there. To me, it looked like a half of a grapefruit of water size just kind of stuck to the back of his head. And it, there was little, little droplets, right? They looked about the size of peas, maybe, kind of zipping around in, in, inside his helmet. And then they get stuck to the glass. And, uh, but his comm boom, microphone booms are kind of right by the corner of his your mouth. They didn't have anything on it. I could kind of see that your comm cap was wet. Um, but again, we were just having well, a I could feel it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's just that normal conversation that he and I were having prior to motion that was just that little bit of false sense of security that it's OK to split. Um, but I think what's so interesting is water and everything reacts differently, right, in microgravity and also surface tension, right, with the water and how it migrated over your head. And that's really interesting to observe while you're not moving. Uh, you wouldn't think that motion would have a, a play a role, but it sounds like it did. That the fact when you started migrating or moving back toward the airlock, it caused the water to migrate in a different way. So there's a part in that in the documentary where you see me putting water on my own head. And I had done that several times. That specific part was from a short video that I made in response of a video that Karen Nyberg made of washing her hair. And it got like 14 million views. Uh -huh. so I thought, and not well, to be outdone. Right. <laughs> so I'm like, well, if she can get 50 million views for washing her hair, I can wash my hair. <laughs> so that that was what. So, the, but that video is me putting water on my head, spraying it, and then grabbing a towel and drying my head and saying, "That's it." <laughs> but it's. But then it became it became a tool to, for for us to understand that water just looks like that. And I made that for my daughters too. That I, I made the, uh, this afro of hair of water on my head. <laughs> And, and the way it jiggles and moves, but it stays there. It sticks to your skin, of which I have a lot on my head. And, <laughs> and, it, just, and it doesn't go away. And I, th that's how I imagine it went, uh, it went around in my helmet. Now, one, one thing that you have to understand is when, once the helmet has your head inside it, there isn't a lot of space between your head and the helmet and, and the surface. So um, it kind of sticks to all the parts. And so that and it, it just that's why it didn't move but once you start moving around moving your head that the water still has a mass and that's why it moved around your uh, original question was about what we would do differently mm -hmm. thinking about it what what can't be missed here is there are literally hundreds of things that we changed coming out of this um, today when we do spacewalks um, they are absolutely the safest they've been in the history of our program because of this event we learn from this. We do we do lots of things differently that um, these guys see some of them. A lot of them they don't see. We process the suits differently. We take very, very close um, care of the water systems on board station so we know that they're clean, so we know they're not going to foul the suits up. We do so many things that we learn from behind the scenes that really that's why we wanted to tell this story that um, it's dramatic, yes, but this led to a lot of changes that um, help these guys be safe when they go out and do spacewalks. And, help us explore, so I don't want that to get lost. There's a lot that you don't see that happened behind this uh, that we took out of this and learned from. That actually was one of my questions about what were some of the new procedures that, that came out of this, so that is really fascinating to know. Um, of course, a spacesuit is a spaceship on your body, right? That has to keep you alive and well and able to do things, and they're really clunky and difficult, I imagine, when you're in space because of the pressurization. 
Um, and we saw in the film a little bit about the kind of training that takes place. Are there new training protocols now as an outcome of this as well? Chris, do you, you guys um, live answer? Yeah. So in terms of training, we generally train the same, I think. There, we are, are, are more heightened awareness and there's additional, we, we wear this cuff uh, set of procedures on our, on our wrist called the cuff checklist, which Luca was referring to in the movie. Um, we've added some pages into that where we don't mess around with water anymore. It, it's like pretty serious right from the get-go. So that's where the training comes in. There is also a little sliver of a kind of like a diaper-like material that we put in the back of the helmet. And, uh, and that's one of the very useful trainings that we do is you go and you put the helmet on, they squirt certain amounts of, of water into this diaper material and you kind of move your head around and you get a feel, okay, that's what uh, 250 milliliters is. And how do you know what milliliters is? A can of soda is 356. So just keep that in mind. <laughs> and, uh, um, and you kind of move your head and you feel, okay, that's one can of soda. And I think it's around like six, seven, a hundred milliliters where people can start to tell. So it's a significant amount of water that the diaper will absorb before you, you can feel it. But that, that's a nice indicator for us. And, and if you're watching spacewalks uh, these days, you'll hear a, a check that the ground says, hey, what's your HAP? HAP stands for high Helmet absorbency absorbing. pad Helmet or something like that. And anyways, the material on the back of your head. And you, and you literally just go like this with your head and you go, oh, yep, it feels dry or it feels the same thi uh, thickness. So that's some of the additional training that, that we've added. The actual nuts and bolts and mechanics of in the water, that's pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. oh, very interesting. So I, one, one question I wondered, uh, Luca, could you have tried to drink the water that was in the helmet? Did you, I mean, you drank the water that was out of the bag. Yeah. <laughs> Could, could you? <laughs> <laughs> so, so the the story. Well, the reason why I drank the water is that they kept asking me about the water from the bag. And I'm like, okay, so I know I'm Italian and I'm a rookie, but I, I would, I'm watching the the spout. So if he squirted out of it, I would be seeing it. Now that I have a heightened attention about it, so. To, to, uh, to make sure that nobody would ask me the question anymore, I just drank it all. <laughs> so I drank it all and I say, oh, it's dry, the bag is dry, so it's not from the water. It's not from the water bag. And, and then at one point, and this is gonna sound funny, but you know, the, it's not like you can really go and catch the water, but there was one, one little bubble that kind of floated and I kind of caught it and drank it. And, uh, and we, I, I think I said, yeah, it's water. It's, and <laughs> I don't remember. I honestly don't remember. I haven't reviewed. I, I haven't reviewed the audio, but I remember. I remember testing the water, and it tasted like kind of plasticky. But to be honest, even the water comes out of the of the water bag after it's been there for several hours. It doesn't it doesn't taste like your your Perrier. So yeah, right. <laughs> I. I was worried that um, that the water might be coming from other parts, and uh, <laughs> but it, but it, uh, you know it, tests, it just tasted like water, a little a little plasticky, and that's what I said. I don't remember now. Um, it's been five years, actually. In two days, it will be exactly five years from the event, and mm -hmm. you know how memories can be fallacious. I don't I don't really remember, but at one point I thought I said I, I told the ground that it was cold or that it felt cold in the back of my head. I don't remember saying. Yeah, you did. I remember you hearing, saying that. And that's when I started to think, oh, that's a little weird. Yeah. Because almost nothing in the suit is cold. You, and so. That's actually one of the changes you talked about changes is that, that in our checklist now we ask, is the water cold? Because if it's cold, it's coming out of the pliss, which is a much different problem than the drink bag or the PVG. So it's one of the changes that came out of that is we have better questions to ask in situations like this. Because I imagine, too, you could think it was coolant, right? Isn't there some kind of fluid that's going through your, your body suit? It's just water. Just, it's pure water as well? Water. Mm. It's water that's been uh, cleaned and iodined and the iodine take it out. 
of it's basically just just plain water and you shouldn't have any any taste because it's not drinking water and act, as a matter of fact now the procedure says do not drink the water because i think that there is a, there is a chance that there are substances that you don't necessarily want to absorb um, so i'm glad that i didn't drink the water but here's a, a question that i get all the time why didn't you just drink all of the water so if you if it ever happens to you before and how the chances, <laughs> the chances are really low, I expect. <laughs> Even for me. Um, I've actually tried this while swimming. If your nose is plugged, you can, you can take a gulp of water, you can swallow it, and that's it. You cannot keep drinking if your nose is plugged. You have to breathe in order to drink water. So even if I wanted to, I couldn't have, because once, my, once the water covered my nose and it, uh, it, went in, it went up due to capillarity, which works really well in orbit, by the way. It's a, it's a fantastic <laughs> phenomenon that you guys studied, right? You had the capillarity experiment. Oh, we did have yeah, and it yeah. worked wonders. Uh, it, and it did in my nose. And uh, uh, despite the fact that it's an Italian nose and quite sizable, it filled it up. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so after that, I couldn't, I couldn't I, even if I wanted to, I could not have drunk. And, and, a, and that was one of the thoughts that is, is not conveyed here in the, in the movie as much. But there, there were a couple of seconds that felt like minutes. It's funny, in a very not funny way, how time slows down. Uh, when, when you feel when you feel you're in danger. So once once I once the sun set and I felt that water over my nose and over my eyes, um, e everything felt to just slow down. And one of the first thoughts once I couldn't breathe through my nose anymore was, okay, how much time do I have? Just you know, I I have no idea if the next breath I take is uh, is going to be a gulp of water. And even if it wasn't and it didn't happen. You, the fact that you don't know, it's almost as scary. When you think about it, I really tried to push it away and not to think about it. But that was when I, when I called Chris first. Hey, Chris, I'm, I think I'm a little, uh, I said, what, what did I say? I think I, um, I'm disoriented. And then and you couldn't hear me, so I called ground, then I called the station, nobody could hear me. That's when I, okay, I think I gotta go back. Um, but so um, I just answered a couple of questions that, that I hear all the time. So the bottom line is, if your if if your nose is full with water, you cannot really drink anything. And it's very painful when you have water up your nose. I've had that experience when I was a younger kid swimming. I hope you didn't snort it. No, no. <laughs> that's really painful. Yes, <laughs> I've done it. That's fine. <laughs> Well, I'm curious, um, this, it's really extraordinary to participate in a documentary about something like this. And I, I'm curious what you hope the public will take away, because this is a film we're going to actually have on our schedule here at Space Center Houston. And it will be, I'm sure, widely distributed. What, do you, what are your hopes that the public will take away from, uh, from this documentary? Maybe I'll start with you, Chris Hansen. Yeah. yeah, let me say, so when we started the idea of this film, I, was, I, want, I talked uh, to Mark and his team, and I said, I want to do this film, but I want to make sure that the message coming out of this is positive. That when we come away, that we want everybody to come away saying, yep, we want you to see how dangerous this is that we do. The fact that we have actual human beings that are risking their lives to do exploration, and that it's very difficult, but that we wanted to focus on the fact that we use these things to learn. Um, there's a certain administrator in NASA, I won't mention names, so I don't get in trouble, who said this was actually a gift. Unfortunately, we have a, a history in the agency um, from the Apollo 1 fire to Challenger to Columbia where we've lost people and it's taken those kinds of things to get our attention and learn. This was a case where we didn't lose anybody. Luke is still with us, we didn't hurt him, um, but we didn't want to let that, lose that opportunity to learn from this and get better. So what we really wanted to come out of this movie was a positive message that our teams learn from these things, we get better and that's really how we do exploration. One of the things I loved, I heard Lucas say at the end of this film that all of the successes we've had um, really are built on the failures and mistakes we've made in the past. And th they're very important, we learn a lot from them. So that's really what we hope everybody takes out of this film is sort of the positive side about this, that we learn from, we learn from our mistakes and we move on. But I think that's so important because the real opportunity requires risk. You know, you have to be calculated about it, but there's always a level of risk. 
you're going to go beyond what um, what is safe and what we are we all know. I want to give the um, general public an opportunity and all of you as well to to ask questions. And so I'm going to have my colleague Elise here um, read some of the questions that are coming through online. Of an anomaly, and how long did the investigation take? Uh, well, that's a yes, we did. We definitely got to it. Although, what was interesting is we didn't get to it while they were on orbit. In fact, it was months later after they were back on the ground when we actually found out what happened. We were a little worried about it. Um, it's it take me hours and hours to explain what it was. It, they, we hint at it in the film that there was a, a filter that we contaminated on the ground. That filter ended up making it on orbit. It contaminated the inside of the suit, which led to this problem. We figured out how that filter got contaminated and why. We control that very carefully today. One of the interesting things I want to mention was that there are a lot of things on space station that are dangerous. When you have a mishap like this, generally we just stop doing whatever we're doing until we understand it. Um, we didn't understand it. Um, we actually had to do three separate EVAs after this event on orbit to save the space station before we had any idea what caused this. Um, that's not a position we like being in, but we did it as safely as we could. They all worked really well. Um, it, it's just, again, highlights a lot of the differences between working on the ground and working in orbit. We can't f stop flying the space station. Um, it's flying 24 hours a day. We have to keep it working. Um, so we did, un we did uncover the root cause. It took, my investigation was months. It probably took us six months, six to seven months before we really understood what happened. And then years to really fix all of the things we wanted to fix to make it safer. I was very happy that I did not break the suit. <laughs> <laughs> Our next question is, uh, Luca, did you have any long-term effects from the incident? I have no idea. <laughs> um, I'm flying again next year, and I'm looking forward to to do more EVAs. As I'm... Thank you. So, um, and to be honest, you know, once once I was out of the suit, I was like, okay, let's can we swap the suit and go outside and finish the job, because that that's what we do. I mean, you have to understand that my background is that I'm a, I'm a fighter pilot, a test pilot. I'm basically a knuckle drug in the undertow, so uh, <laughs> it, I'm pretty callous when it comes to understanding danger and what it can do to me. So uh, I was ready to go outside the next day. I've had, I've had close calls before, and uh, the best way to cope with the close calls is to just keep going, in my opinion. So this one is for Chris. Uh, specifically, how did your SEAL training prepare you for this? And uh, did your SEAL team come to mind as you were out there during this EVA? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think it's really operational background. For me, I got that in the SEAL teams, test pilots, other people get their operational background. But that, that training, and kind of Luca touched on it, allows thing, allows you to slow a, a situation down and process all of the inputs and then um, decide on, on a course of action. Of course, we had a team together and we were doing that. And I mentioned a, a few questions ago, all the stuff that went through my head really quickly. Um, and though that skill to be able to do that, for me, was honed in the SEAL teams as I grew up in my professional career, so certainly there. but. Um, uh, I didn't specifically think about my SEAL team buddies. Hey, if they're out there online, sorry dudes. <laughs> the next question is, are the headsets now made to be waterproof? Uh, actually, the headsets we use today are exactly, the same, uh, are exactly the same as they had then. What we do now is we make darn sure that water doesn't get into the helmet. We've got a lot of things in place to make sure the water doesn't get in there. Um, Can I add a little detail to that? Mm -hmm. So that the fabric of the, of the headset is waterproof. Mm -hmm. But the water was in the woven parts of it. So um, technically, the, the, the comm cap was not wet itself. It was just the water was in, in between all the holes and, and and sticking to my to my head, the part that uh, we are really worried about is the, the actual 
ears, because just like when you are under the shower, and if you have water that gets into, into your ears, then you don't hear anything. But of course, you can shake your head and take it out. You cannot shake your head and pull out water when you are in orbit. So the next question is, uh, was the suit able to be fixed in space, or did you have to wait to come back to Earth to fix it? Uh, interesting. So um, actually, several days after uh, the, the EVA, we had the crew go in. And you saw a little bit of it in the video. Luca was looking at the back of the PLIS. We had the crew go in and actually take out the part. We did a little bit of testing, and we isolated the problem to a device called a fan pump separator that's inside. We had the crew actually remove it. We flew it down on a Soyuz vehicle. And we took it apart down here on the ground. So we figured out what was wrong with it. Um, we ended up fixing that suit, actually stayed on orbit for several more years. We put new fan pump separators in it um, to clean it. So we actually ended up fixing it on orbit. Eventually, we had to fly up some new parts to do it with. It took a little bit, but that suit stayed on orbit for quite a while. We have it down now, uh, and we're looking at it. But. One more question? Sure. Here. Uh, why didn't Houston call for an evacuation since it was an issue they had not experienced before? And also, can the astronauts go above mission control if they think an evacuation is needed? What was the first part of the question? Um, it was asking why didn't Houston control uh, call for an evacuation sooner? Let me, answer, an abort. let me answer the first part of that, and then I'll let Chris answer the second part. The first part is because we didn't understand that what was happening. We didn't know it was a problem, and that's really, we talk about that a little bit. Our understanding of this particular failure mode wasn't very good. We do now, and we would terminate a lot more quickly now. It's one of the things that came out of this. In terms of, at, in the moment, I'll let you answer that, Chris. About, could you terminate if you wanted to? Yeah, absolutely. We, the two crew members and the mission control, everybody has a vote. And we certainly could say, hey, this is more, this is worse than, than, um, than, the team on the ground has the information. They're, they're processing information as they, as, they, as, as they get it. And sometimes our eyeballs uh, have just a little bit more data in front of us that we can't quite articulate. So we clearly have the vote and the ability to uh, escalate that and say, hey, no, 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 we need to be done right now. Let's go. Uh, but for the reasons that we talked about earlier, we didn't do that. We didn't have a sense of urgency until it became urgent. <laughs> but, yeah. but I think I think you made a really good distinction though between contingency and emergency, right? When you talked about you can plan for things and then there are things that you don't anticipate that happen. So uh, we do have one more question, um, Luca. How did you calm yourself and not panic? And did you think of your family, or did you focus mainly on procedures? Yeah. So to be honest, at that moment. Um, I just didn't want to drown. So I was, I was thinking of just in steps. So I, I, I have about uh, 15 years in, in flying, uh, military flying. And if you stop thinking about the moment on an airplane that's flying at 500 knots, the problem is already behind you. You know, you're, already, you know, you're flying seven miles per minute. So. Um, I just have learned through experience, just, just like Chris was saying, through operational experience, you learn that you don't focus on the problem, but you think about the solutions. So at the time, what I was, when I figured out that I was isolated by myself and I just had to take care of it, I started thinking automatically, what, you know, what are the next steps to get myself out of the way? There really, there really isn't a lot of space in, in in a small brain to think about other things. And to, it's for me, as far as I'm concerned, both as a, as a pilot or as an astronaut, there is almost a switch. When I put on the helmet, you know, before, before I put on the helmet, we can talk about the family, we can talk about how beautiful the Earth is, and the sunrise and all that. Once I put the helmet on, it, it's a switch. There's nothing else. Um, and I'm not going to be thinking about my family. I'm not going to be thinking about my daughters on the ground. Um, I'm just going to be thinking about the EVA. Once I was in that situation, I was thinking mostly, okay, can I open, can I open the, the helmet per, purge valve? Will it do anything? I didn't open it because, to be honest, I wasn't sure that it would do something positive, and it would certainly start taking air out of my, out of my helmet, uh, which... Uh, 
So I, I thought that, you know, if, if, if push come to shove, I would have opened the helmet, purge valve. We also have a bigger valve on the front of the suit. That's a big hole that you put in the suit. So you want to think two or three times before you open a valve. But I also thought about that one, trying to get the flow, or trying to create a flow of sorts in order to clear my nose if it had come to my, to my mouth. It, only, it was only six minutes of, of translation uh, before I got to the, to the airlock. Once I got to the airlock and I, and I could actually see something, because the problem is that without lights, I couldn't see anything. But the airlock is always illuminated. Once I saw the airlock, all I was thinking about was getting inside and make sure that I had enough breathing air that once Chris closed the helmet, at that point, once, sorry, once Chris closed the hatch, I, I thought, okay, whatever happens now, I'm gonna be okay. Because even if I have to take my helmet off, which is a terrible idea, um, at least I'm inside. I know that there are people that have, have been through very rapid uh, depressurization cases and survived. So I thought that you know, if I couldn't breathe anymore, if I was gonna drown, I would rather depressurize, pass out, these guys can revive me rather than, rather than drown. So I, I felt I, at that point I was uh, only focusing on different steps that I could take. Once, once we started repressurizing, the only thing I could think about was how much my ears hurt. Uh, it was, and I don't wish it on anybody, it's a terrible feeling. It's, uh, the story is not in the movie, but it's almost ironic. So we have a Valsalva, it's a little, a Valsalva is something that you can plug your nose to, to blow so that just like when you descend from an airplane and you feel the pressure on your ear, you plug your nose, blow so that it relieves the pressure. The Valsalva in, in the helmet is a little piece of sponge. So it did what, what sponges do, it soaked with water. So when I put my nose to, to um, compensate my ears, it sheared off. And it's, I have this image of it floating in front of, in front of my eyes. I'm like, well, that's, that's fancy, but, <laughs> but useless. And, and so that, that, that was, you know, my main concern was, was just thinking, closing my eyes, not moving, because moving made the water slosh around and it was very uncomfortable. And that's when I felt Chris's hand squeezing me. And I didn't know what he was trying to tell me, but, I, but if he squeezed my hand, I'm gonna squeeze back. No. <laughs> and, uh, um, and I think that, that Valsalva is actually my, is actually my desk at, on the sixth floor. Uh, I saved it. <laughs> That's great. Well, I think those are our, all of our questions. I would like to ask if any of you have final comments or thoughts that you'd like to share before we wrap up the program. Uh, just one thing came, came to mind as Luke was talking about what his thoughts were. As um, I came, the, the front side of the space station is a little bit higher elevation than the airlock. So I was coming kind of what looks down to me as I was coming down this final piece of metal called the Cedar Spur. And um, I saw Luca's feet kind of disappear and go in. And I remember thinking to myself, I got to close the hatch. And and again, all, it's funny how all these things that go through your mind. I remember thinking, stuff never gets better really fast, but it sure can go to hell in a handbasket really fast. <laughs> and how can my hands not make this get worse? Because I knew that my hands had to do stuff. Like it had to bring a, a tether in, it had to close a hatch, crank a handle, and not have any little piece of string or something in the, in the uh, seal. And so, I hate to say it, but once I saw his feet go in, I kind of didn't care about Luca anymore. And it sounds bad, but, but it, and I, I, I mean that in a way of, now it's my turn. Luca did his part, he got himself there. Now it's my turn to break even and get the hatch closed. And so that's what I was focused on. And I don't even remember, like right now, I remember seeing Luca's feet go in and the next part in my memory is my hand on the circular handle cranking it. I do not have a recollection to this day of what my actions were to get in, uh, which is really weird. But anyways, you just kind of, like Luke was saying, you just put yourself in the zone, muscle memory, training, repetition from the NBL, 
it just happened. And here, and here we are. So. And I'm glad you were not thinking about me. <laughs> and that's what I meant by, you know, having somebody like Chris doing, doing his job. And you, I was 100% positive that Chris was doing the right thing. And at that moment, thinking about me was not the right thing. The right thing was thinking about the job that needed to be done. If, if I may uh, go back to a previous mm -hmm. question, what would I like to, uh, the, the public to take out of this movie? There's one thing that's, uh, that's come up to, to mind um, several times after the event, but more recently, uh, and it's, it's something that, it, it, it's about winning and fear of failure. And it, it is, I think this is a good movie to talk about that. That we should not be afraid of failures. The, it, we live in, a, in, a, in an Asian time where we all want to always, constantly, all the time, appear as if we are winning, we are in control, we know what we're doing, always, 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 all the time. Well, that's not reality. And when, we are in, when you're in the business of exploration or uh, innovation, technology, evolution, Failure is a normal part of life and of our job. But it's only a bad thing if you don't learn from it. And, I, and one of the things that I learned is that I have a fantastic team that trains me on the ground that even though they didn't know what they were training me for, I trusted them with, the, with my training and the result is that Chris and I were able to come out of a situation that we had not even trained for, but that, well, that the result comes from the training I received. So uh, th this failure now evolved into something that's much better, safer procedures, safer, uh, better checklists, better understanding on the suit, better understanding of the behavior of the water. So out of failure, you can come out with, you can get a lot of successful future events. So um, j maybe that's one thought that I would like the public to take. Don't be afraid of, don't be afraid of trying and failing and getting better at what you do. Excellent. For, for me, lastly, I want to thank a couple of people. So, so Phil is here with us, uh, Austin and Alex, who really made this movie. They took a subject, a story, that I'm really passionate about, and they made this uh, really awesome movie that lets us talk about this in a way that lets a lot of people understand the message that Luca talked about. So thank you guys so much for making just a really awesome film, uh, first of all. Um, second of all, I really, I really want this movie to pay tribute to the brave men and women who get in our spacesuits, Chris and Luca here. There's at least a couple other in the audience that have done it too. Um, they put their lives on the line um, to help us really explore. And lastly, I want to thank, I mentioned them earlier, but the hundreds of people that you don't see in this film that are behind the scenes, that are, a lot of them are here with us today, that make these spacewalks possible from the engineers, the flight controllers, um, all the folks that work in my office and around the center, around the world, really, that make this possible. I really want to thank them, and I hope this film really pays tribute to you guys. Uh, and thank you for being, as, being really the best at what you do in the world. So thank you. Well, I think I can't even add a more eloquent closure than you did, Chris. That was absolutely perfect to summarize this, this whole experience. really want to express heartfelt thanks to all of you for your incredible service and your courage and what you do to benefit humanity through the space program, and also sharing all the lessons from this uh, experience and the, and the creation of the film. I think there's so many lessons learned out of this. I'm also really thrilled that this was broadcast live through Facebook Live. You can all go back if you want to watch this again. It will be on our website under special events. You can click under Thought Leader Series. Um, we offer these series so you, we can have these kind of conversations so you can hear from people who are working in all aspects of the space program. Um, if you're interested in coming to future programs at Space Center Houston, you can sign up on our website to be on our email invitation list. I just want to highlight a few programs that we have coming up. Uh, we have a fun evening next uh, week on the 17th called Starlight Social where it's going to be a focus on human health and performance. And we'll have our scientists in residence, Dr. John Charles there. 
and actually some fun uh, other kind of programming associated with that evening. We also have coming up um, on August 7th, the Expedition 5455 Crew Debrief, which is always fantastic. So we'll have the crews from those missions and everyone who supported those missions here to tell us about their experiences. Um, and then our next um, th our later in, uh, August Thought Leader Program on the 24th, which was just organized, is going to feature actually three leading women of NASA Johnson Space Center, of Vanessa Weiss, Debbie Conder, and Kathy Kerner. So with that, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us this evening. Thank you, gentlemen, for being here. And we look forward to seeing you at a future Thought Leader Program. Have a great evening. <laughs>